Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's the 1st of April, April Fool's Day. It's the perfect day to start a brand new gardening podcast. April is derived from the word apparit, which means to open. Yet every Prince fan or Northern gardener knows that sometimes it snows in April. So April flowers need to take heed. Open at your own risk. Here are some brevities for today. April is National Pecan Month, Lawn and Garden Month, Fresh Celery Month, and National Safe Digging Month. And here's a quick life hack for gardeners this spring. Add 811 to your phone contacts. Save it under digging and in the notes, add a reminder to call at least three days before you dig. In 1851, a note was written to Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward of Wardian Case fame. The note was from Southwood Smith, an eminent English doctor, minister, and the father of public health in England. During his time, Southwood Smith was recognized as the originator of preventative medicine, and he was constantly writing about health in ways the masses could easily understand and remember. When Smith wrote to Ward on April 1st, 1851, he was part of the successful effort to get the window tax repealed. Ever since 1696, England had imposed a tax based on, of all things, wait for it, the number of windows on a house. Crazy, right? On the plus side, the window tax was a no-brainer. Assessors just walked down the street, counted the windows on a house, maybe stopped to smell the roses, and Bob's your uncle. There's your tax bill. But then the window tax story took a dark turn. Folks started bricking up their windows or building homes with fewer windows simply to avoid the tax. No windows, means no light or ventilation, and that created stuffy, sick living spaces. By the mid-1800s, doctors like Smith realized that the window tax had to go. So why would a guy like Smith, a doctor fighting the window tax, reach out to a plant guy like Ward? Well, it just so happened that Ward was conducting experiments on the influence of light on plants and animals. Essentially, Ward was proving Smith's point. Light was vital to health. Ward often shared the story of how he had once grown two identical geraniums in different conditions, one in the light and the other in darkness. The geranium grown in the dark was stunted and sickly. It had a skinny thread-like stem, and it was studded with pathetic excuses for leaves that were no bigger than the head of a pin. Smith realized that often plants were enjoying better living conditions than people. Like plants, people need light. Here's Smith's to-the-point note to Ward. My dear sir, if you should have recently made any additional observations on the influence of light on health or disease, I should be glad if you would favor me with it. In honor of Smith's note on the influence of light, here's a poem from Louis McNeese called Sunlight on the Garden. Lewis wrote this poem in 1936 after his divorce from Mary Ezra, and it's probably one of his best known works. At the time, Lewis lived at number four Keats Grove, just down the street from the romantic poet John Keats' impeccable white Georgian villa, which happens to be where Keats wrote his best love poems. If you're ever in London, check out Keats House and Gardens. It's a veritable time capsule, and it has awesome reviews on TripAdvisor. Then take a stroll past Keats Grove Number 4 and peek at Lewis McNeese's home and front garden. It's still very charming. McNeese's poem contrasts lightness and darkness. Lightness is life and our experiences. The garden on a sunny day a sky good for flying, and sitting with a loved one in the rain. The darkness 
is the march of time, the sunlight that fades, the sounds of sirens and church bells that often accompanies tragedy. Sunlight on the Garden by Lewis McNeese. The sunlight on the garden hardens and grows cold. We cannot cage the minute within its nets of gold. When all is told, we cannot beg for pardon. Our freedom as freelances advances toward its end. The earth compels. Upon it, sonnets and birds descend. And soon, my friend, we shall have no time for dances. The sky was good for flying, defying the church bells and every evil iron siren in what it tells. The earth compels. We are dying, Egypt, dying and not expecting pardon. Hardened in heart anew, but glad to have sat under thunder and rain with you and grateful too for sunlight on the garden. Today is the 92nd birthday of Peter Kundal, a Tasmanian gardener. Peter was the friendly host of the long-running TV show Gardening Australia, one of the first shows committed to 100% organic practices. Peter inspired both young and old to garden. In his epic Lemon Tree episode, Peter got a little carried away and essentially finished pruning when the tree was little more than a stump. Thereafter, condolization was synonymous with over pruning. Peter learned to garden as a little boy. His first garden was a vegetable patch on top of an air raid shelter in Manchester, England. His family was impoverished, his father an abusive alcoholic. Two of his siblings died of malnutrition. Yet through it all, the garden brought stability, nourishment, and reprieve. Of that time, Peter recalls lying in bed in the morning, waiting for it to be light so I could go out and get going in my garden. I used to think there was some gas given out by the soil that produced happiness. Today's book recommendation would have surely gotten a five-star review from Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward. It's The New Terrarium, Creating Beautiful Displays for Plants and Nature by Tova Martin. Tova offers lots of excellent ideas for using everyday objects as terrariums, which is something I love to do as well. Some of my homemade terrariums include clear cake plate stands and covers for miniature aquatic plants, or even a large vase turned upside down on an old silver platter, which is a stunning way to showcase a small orchid or fern. Today's chore is to do a trellis check. What is still standing? What needs to be repaired? What is installed? And what needs to go? Finally, here's a little trellis joke. What do you call it when a lighthouse, a trellis, a windstorm, a dune, and a Halloween costume get together? A beacon lattice and tornado sand witch. <laughs> Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org. And be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And while you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for The Daily Gardener community on Facebook and request to join. And finally, a special thank you to my team at Podfly Productions, where my editor is Eric Begay. Thank you.